Okay, uh, hello, we're here for our uh, empathy training facilitators uh, session. And, whoop, and let me uh, share our screen. And we have a little slide deck. So this is uh, Empathy Circle Facilitators Training, a session for the facilitator role. And it's hosted by the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, which you can find at uh, cultureofempathy.com and, uh, and by the Empathy Tent, which you can find more information about at empathytent.com. And this is an invitation to viewers where we're going to be posting this video. And if you're watching this, uh, we invite you to take part in an empathy circle for bridging social and political divides. Uh, and uh, also, to become an Empathy Circle facilitator, you can watch this video and also become a facilitator of these Empathy Circles and you know take part in an in-person training. And you can find more information about this at empathycircle.com. So I invite you to go there and, and check it out and all the steps are there for how to get involved. Uh, this is our module one. Uh, empathy, oh, the empathy Circle Facilitators Training, we've done number one, which was the how, what, and why, the what, why, and how of Empathy Circles. We've done the second one, speaker role. We have uh, did last time we did reflective listener role, and this time it's the facilitator role. And just a note to everyone participating, you know, take care of yourself. Feel free to get up, stretch, move. Use the restrooms. I should put a restroom picture in here or something. Stretch maybe to create a little bit of image for next time. And we're going to start with a quiet uh, self-empathy, uh, two minutes. And I'll get us back here. And so this is just a bit way to uh, connect with ourselves, you know, to check in. Uh, feel into our bodies. If someone could take time, uh, Bill, do you have a clock there? Just a two minute, maybe cell phone. I didn't. And so <sighs> getting comfortable in our chairs. And you, know, you can close your eyes if you feel it. We're just going to do some self empathy. So to feel, we want to step away from what's been going on and the hectic you know stuff that's been happening during the day up to this point and just feel into your body taking some deep breaths you can feel the breath you know going in and out of your body you can perhaps feel the bottom of the chair your feet on the ground just notice the sensations in your body and after two minutes, Bill will let us know.
time. Well, that's a rude awakening. Uh, so yeah, so now uh, we want to go around and uh, just have a, a minute or so check in per person. How are how are you now? And when you end, you're you're sharing to do a physical emotion of what you're feeling, and we're going to mirror that. And everyone's going to mirror that to have sort of an empathic uh, synchronization. And uh, I guess I can start. Um, how am I now? I was feeling. Calm. I've just we just did an empathy circle before this, and I really enjoyed. And I feel it grounded me. Feeling a little disappointed that every, uh, a couple other people can't be here who were going, to, and uh, so a little bit of it feel a little disappointed. Um, but also feel up. I, we, I kept changing the the meeting date, so some understanding, so a feeling of understanding too for the difficulties that that caused. Um, so the overall feeling would be sort of trying to be calm, calm and balanced, mm -hmm. slowing down. <laughs> yeah, so that the word is slowing down. Slow down. If you want to mirror that sound, slowing down, slowing down. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that feels good. Uh, Jati, would you be willing to go? Yeah, <clears throat> recovering from a flu and still not finding my balance and struggling to. Find energy, and I don't feel very connected. And but um, I thought that even if I can't contribute much, I might just be able to uh, listen. Um, I I just I keep thinking I'm better, and then I, you know, my energy drops off. So that's where I'm at. Um, I don't know what physical movement, whatever. <laughs> okay, thanks, uh, Bill. Um, I'm feeling fine. Uh, uh, I feel for Jati because I, a couple of years ago, I went through the, the lingering flu, and I. Um, you know, it was no fun, <laughs> and um, uh, but I'm feeling good. Um, I enjoyed the last uh, call, um, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, just stretch. Mm. Okay, thank you, Susan, and you're muted. <coughs> so I'm feeling happy to be here. I was looking forward to this. And the house is very cold where I am. I saw something or read something about it's good to let the fresh air into your house to take care of mold and stuff. So I've opened all the windows, <laughs> turned off the heat, and I guess it's about you know 50 something degrees outside. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've got my jacket on and I'm just trying to stay warm. So that's that's sort of my overall state. Um, when I came on the call and um, we were thinking it was probably only going to be three of us, then when Jyoti came, I got really happy. <laughs> and, and I said, hey, Jyoti. And, and then, Jyoti, I heard that you were feeling, you know, ill with the flu and under the weather and I so I've got this background thought maybe I was like really insensitive to Jyoti and just kind of banged against her, her, her boundaries today so I'm feeling a little bit um, shy sorry about that thought I'm not really thinking that I know what Jyoti's feel or Jyoti's feeling but I'm just that's my own self-talk I'm chastising myself a little bit 
Um, but overall, my feeling is like I'm kind of freezing. So it's like, brr, 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 Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that, those check-ins. Uh, okay, let's go back <clears throat> to the slide deck. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a uh, session for the facilitator role. I want to explore the uh, topic of being an empathy circle facilitator. And want to get a little bit of an overview of today's session. First, we want to review the facilitator role, just you know what it is. Uh, then we'll go over question one, which everyone listed questions that they had about the facilitator role. There was some, uh, then we'll go over the tips, share those tips, and do a round of empathic listening about the facilitator experiences, questions, insights and then talk about the uh, next steps and um, do a session and module uh, feedback. So this is the last session for this uh, module. And to start with, okay, we have the, the facilitator role. Uh, you know, we had, I had mentioned the other roles. And so we have the facilitator role uh, divides into, you know, a couple sub roles. So there's a, circle facilitator circle role for if there's a group of six or less people you know more or less uh, that uh, you facilitate a circle uh, with them there's also the role of the co-facilitator sometimes we have someone that uh, helps with uh, co-facilitating and uh, then there's the empathy cafe facilitator role so this is, uh, if there's more than six people, and if you have seven, eight, 10, 20 people, we divide into smaller groups. And uh, it takes a person to facilitate that larger, uh, that larger event. And then every group circle has a facilitator of its own. But we decided not to really go into the cafe facilitator role uh, maybe in module two, we'll do a whole different module just on hosting a empathy cafe because it's much more complex. And we're just looking at the what it's like to facilitate an empathy circle in, in, in this uh, session. So what is the, uh, there are some uh, questions. Uh, there's, it's, there's been a little question in terms of determining the terms for this so is it a facilitator or host some organism you know some processes call it a host some facilitator you know a facilitator i looked up the definitions makes an action or process easy or easier and a host receives or entertains other people as guests and there's processes like the art of hosting which is a uh, you know, facilitation process, they use the word uh, host. So just uh, kind of a quick feedback. What does everybody feel about the term facilitator or host? This is kind of just helping, you know, me to kind of determine to, you know, we haven't nailed down like all the terms, you know, fully yet. And I kind of like facilitator, but then I uh, just wonder what other what others think about that uh, well I see facilitator as being the facilitator of the actual circle and host that I see is what you've also called producer the person who oh, puts it together. Mm -hmm. okay I like the term facilitator okay Chati, just any quick comments there just you're muted I'm accustomed to the facilitator word being used. Okay, okay. Well, that's, that's helpful for me. Thanks for that. So going back to the slideshow, uh, the main role of the facilitator is helps everyone follow the empathic listening uh, process. So we have the basic process, and it's mainly to keep everyone in the process. Uh, you know, once the ball gets rolling, in the process, there's not a, a lot to do unless people sort of start breaking out of the process or don't, you know, kind of follow through. So there's activities like, you know, welcoming everyone, explaining the roles and the process, you set the topic, keep time and answer questions and close and 
then the, the uh, co-facilitator can help with some of that, for example, timekeeping as well. And uh, as a facilitator, you know, you're also a participant. Sometimes it overlaps with being a producer, a coordinator, or, you know, so the roles aren't so fixed, but we are trying to, to uh, separate them a bit so that we can sort of articulate, you know, sort of different nuances of each of the roles. Uh, but sometimes the facilitator ends up just doing, you know, kind of everything. Uh, the co-facilitator uh, supports the facilitator, like I was saying, maybe with timekeeping or some of the details, sometimes with note-taking. And also the co-facilitator can, can be sort of a mentoring uh, where the co-facilitator is just learning how to, uh, you know, facilitate and kind of talk with the facilitator about that and just sort of learn by being supportive. Uh, and again, the co-facilitator may also serve as a participant and sometimes help with producer, coordinator role. So these roles are not totally, you know, fixed, but we're just, again, making general uh, kind of categories here, just to kind of explore them more in depth. So we had our first on arrival question, number one, to list several questions you have on the facilitator role. So everyone had a chance to write those down. And we just wanna go around and share those. And this is just a way of kind of hearing where everyone is in terms of their curiosity or what, they, what questions they have about being a facilitator. Uh, I can start. So mine was, uh, for me, it was like, how might I be more effective? So I'm really looking at being more effective. And how might I get into a better, and an empathic facilitator mindset. So there's sort of a, you know, a consciousness, you know, being calm, grounded, sensitive. And sometimes I get kind of, uh, you know, anxious and start talking fast. And then I want to kind of be calmer and more grounded. And, and then uh, I also wonder is, well, what are the different facilitator mindsets that other people have? You know, I really like to hear from facilitators. What is, what is your, your mindset? And uh, how might we create a more positive experience for participants? So, you know, let's uh, be sensitive to that. And how might we support empathy circle facilitators? Uh, you know, it just is another question I have. So scrolling down, Bill, you were next on the list. Okay, sure. Um, I think I, I said uh, achieving balance. And what I mean by that is that um, as Edwin said, when the, when, the, when the circle process is going well, you really want a light touch. You really, the magic is in the interaction between individuals, and you don't want to uh, distract from that. And then on the other hand, when the, um, you know, the process is being broken or being bent out of shape, then you, you kind of lose that. So it's a question of you know, how you can intervene to keep uh, the structure intact and whole with the lightest touch possible. Okay, that was the one that you'd written. Was there any more that come to mind? You're welcome to add some more. Do you have any others? Um, right, uh, not, uh, I mean, I think your, you know, the questions that you posed, uh, you know, were good going forward. Um, but um, I, um, yeah, uh, again, in my experience, is, is basically I was sort of like, you know, I would just go into a group. You could never predict who the participants would be or what the situation would be. And so you had to kind of think on your feet. And so uh, I'm very comfortable with the parameters here. So, um, you know, I feel pretty comfortable, um, you know, with that. Oh, there are other questions, uh, but I guess I would deal with them in real time. They're not abstract things that I worry about. Okay. Then uh, Susan was next on the list here. Okay. I wrote down something about timekeeper, but that's not really that big of a concern for me. I thought of a couple others that are bigger, but I'll just say the timekeeper thing briefly, and then I'll say my other more real concerns. Uh, I've just noticed that some of the times 
the speaker doesn't see the signal that the timekeeper gives. So it's like, how can the facilitator support the timekeeper to maybe go out of their comfort zone a little bit and, and risk interrupting? Because oh, sometimes, I, I've noticed this across the board, not just here, that timekeepers can tend to be a little shy uh, not wanting to be interruptive. So um, I like to just at, maybe ask the timekeeper to hold the hold the clock up or whatever the signal is or the time card up a long enough, like like really longer than they feel comfortable doing. So that's that's just one simple thing. I guess I answered my own question there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you had another one about judgmental language. Yeah, um, and that one really wasn't one of my personal ones either. Let me say what my more personal ones are, although I like the one about judgmental language. I think that's interesting, but that's kind of theoretical. It's never actually happened to me. Um, well, I'll go ahead with that one since it's there. Um, so let's say somebody's saying how they feel about a certain issue, and they name a certain politician, and they, and they call him um oh a fascist or a jerk or something and um then the person who's listening might um oh well, you know might either have to be in the awkward position of repeating that or uh the person who's listening might get triggered if they are on the other side of a, a, the issue something like that so how does the facilitator intervene in that? Mm -hmm. so that's, a, that's, that's a genuine question. Okay. Um, Any you know, others? I have my up? own answers in my own type of group. <laughs> yeah. But that's, you know, that's separate. My type of groups are quite a bit different than these. Um, yeah, my, um, really most anxiety comes when I'm leading a Zoom call, and I do this elsewhere too, when I'm managing, when I'm doing a little producer stuff, like when I'm managing the screenshots, I've learned that sometimes when a screenshot goes up, then it hides the rest of the group on some devices and then other devices when the screenshot goes up, you can see the group and you can see the screenshot, like it's usually a handout with some, um, like maybe an interview that we're working with when I'm training coaches or something. And so <clears throat> I notice that um, I get nervous and I lose my presence and I lose my ability to, to just really tune into people when I'm managing technical stuff that I don't understand very well. So I make it, you know, I, I kind of make it transparent that, hey, I'm still learning about this. Uh, what do you guys see on your screen and stuff like that? So I'm I'm always trying to learn, but um, I can't, my story here is I, I just, I just can't keep up with all this. Yeah. So <laughs> I want to, I want yeah, to get I better I, at technology. I translate that like how to address the anxiety and loss of presence of a Zoom call and technical issues or yeah. kind of a, kind of like technical, like the technology pulls you out of sort of a, a presence. And, and that's yeah. truly just about me personally. Mm. So I yeah, guess I'll stop cool. there. Okay. Um, yeah, it's good to have a producer that helps, does all the technical stuff here. Yeah. So, okay, then uh, the, Sam was next. She, did, she couldn't make it, but she did leave some questions. So I'll, I'll read those. She says, uh, how can I effectively guide the participants when the structure is not being properly followed? Uh, how do I explain what an empathy circle is to participants who have never done one before? So that, that's the pre-production. How can I come up with specific topics and props, uh, prompts for uh, participants who may need more structure? Okay, glad she did that. So uh, Jati, would you like to, you didn't, you came a little late, so you didn't get to uh, write some, but if you just want to throw some out there, I can write them down. Any questions you have? about the uh, facilitating an empathy circle. I'll jot them down. I don't have any questions. Um, I, I did have a thought about one of the question, one of the uh, questions that I read that someone else had written 
it was about you know people not having enough self-awareness to talk about how they're feeling in the moment and um i just thought that it might be helpful to hand out a list of feelings and needs and tell people to just circle a few of those you know in you know take 30 seconds or a minute for to have people do that and then start whatever process it is they to talk you know to do their check-in um you know uh, what I, the question I'm, I'm referring to one i saw one person had put that on mm -hmm. so that self-awareness like if people aren't sort of self-aware yeah she was talking about doing check-ins uh asking people to talk about how they're feeling right now and uh so ran into difficulties with that because people didn't have a, a, enough self-awareness mm -hmm. yeah so, so really how to support people in having self-awareness of what their feelings are and be able to express those is what i'm hearing yeah a lot of people don't know what you're really asking them so if you give them like a sheet of paper with feelings on and have them just go through that and circle or highlight you know five things that they're feeling right now or recently then it gets the ball rolling so they can start to understand and practice dancing in that circle where they where they're talking about feelings okay thanks is, is there more or is that no, that's okay. it then we'll move on that was just our uh, on arrival question number one and let me just share the second one we had so we had a second question is, uh, do you have any tips you know, from your experience for facilitating an empathy circle? And uh, I think that was a tip you just mentioned, Jati, of uh, you know, having a sheet with, with, uh, with uh, feeling names for the check-in. And we can just go down and I'll share my tip. Uh, uh, so the main tip I have is I'm very much uh, learn by doing. So it's just, you know, jump in. I've seen a, of practices that, especially like in mediation trainings, practices, people are like practicing, 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 and they just never do it. So I think it's really good just to just learn by doing. And uh, within the human center design field, which is also called empathic design, uh, it uh, they have a term fail early fail often because you'll succeed faster and that they really try to change the the uh, the attitude of fear of failure uh, and I know people are afraid of like you know failing and but just seeing that you know failing you know things messing up not doing it right is uh, you know something to be avoided and you know you forever kind of getting perfect at it just do it. So <laughs> I guess that's the Nike or whatever it is uh, comment. So that's my tip for facilitating is just get out and do it and, and learn by doing. Um, Bill, you're next here. Sure, I think, um, you know, I just kind of said be real and kind of trust yourself in the sense that, you know, I have been with Edwin in some contentious places, plus I've been in other situations that were very contentious. And um, when you just think of, okay, who am I in this situation? What, are, what is really important? Um, th there should be some review. Um, people kind of accept you. And the other thing about, um, you know, meeting people who are supposedly have uh, radical views, uh, again, if you present yourself in that way, a lot of times, and then without the judgment, uh, there's this big sigh of relief, and then you just have a conversation human to human. So... That's a good de-escalation technique. Trust yourself and then trust the other person that, you know, if you're just being real, they will too. Okay, Susan. Okay, well, um, the tip that I wrote down had to do with, as part of the introduction of the roles, uh, I, prob I probably as facilitator would ask for a volunteer to be timekeeper and um, so mention to the whole group that 
here's what the timekeeper is going to do and then get the timekeeper's agreement explicitly about that you know is that is that something you feel comfortable enough to do and um just somehow um make the whole time thing important but not too important you know, like you know, the way we say it is like it, once the time's up you can you know take more time if you need it if you need to complete your thought don't just stop in the middle mm -hmm. of your sentence mm -hmm. that sort of thing um but if the let's say if the time keeper has held up the thing and the person really is going on and on now there's a there's a challenge so i guess my tip might be to allow the timekeeper as a backup plan to just simply say that's five minutes just in a very neutral tone of voice so that's that's a tip yeah there was another just to add is it not i've heard that not everybody can see everyone if they're on a smaller screen they're, ah. they're hearing so it's good to have a tone in there you know oh. like that's like good. Bill's phone went off and, you know, we, we heard yeah, it. So it no something doubt. has sort of a gentle sound, but it kind of keeps, you know, goes for a little while. So that would yeah. Be so make sure the timekeeper has one of the, you know, iPhones that has a tone or, the, or a, that they're willing to say that's five minutes. Yeah. Cool. Good, good thought. Um, yeah. I have another tip. Oh, uh, great. Came from you, Edwin, talking about what's the facilitator mindset and no, so my answer to that personally and my tip is hold the mindset that I'm modeling this process for others and specifically modeling, talking about feelings, uh, keeping my share short enough for the listener, and of course, modeling empathic listening where I tr try to connect with, with feelings and needs if they're if they're in there anywhere, uh, as well as just the words I heard. So basically, I'm I'm modeling the process. I'm just writing this down too. So I, I'm adding that. So uh, model the mindset and process. There's a, there's another tip I would just add that I didn't think of is to be enjoying the process. Like my partner, Joan, is an educator, and when, and she facilita when she facilitates, she's just having a ball. It's like she kind of radiates with fun, and it doesn't even matter what she says, it's just everybody <laughs> likes the energy, and sometimes I feel kind of like anxious, and then so I'm kind of like modeling this anxiety, and, you know, so there's, that's part of the mindset is like how to really, <clears throat> you know, to have fun with it. So mm -hmm. I would add that as another yeah. tip. <clears throat> and then, okay, I'll add Sam's tip. And Sam is an educator, so she teaches uh, middle school, I think. <clears throat> and <clears throat> she says, uh, if participants seem frustrated with the slow nature of the communication process, I have found it helpful to acknowledge their frustration and how different this process is to normal communication. Provide them options to jot their thoughts down in a journal and reiterate the benefits of following the process. Slowing down the process to eliminate potential misunderstandings and assumptions so that everyone can be seen and understood more completely. Okay, like that. And another tip is I have very, I have found it very helpful to model responses first uh, for participants. I think Susan, you also sort of mentioned that. Uh, Edwin, mm -hmm. I'd like to add something about if participants seem frustrated. Um, in some of my groups, participants will seem frustrated with structured communication practices, like mm -hmm. when I heard you say dot, you know, so forth. Um, and what I say to them is, yes, this is kind of a practice. So following these guidelines keeps us out of our automatic listening patterns, which often have to do with debating or giving our own point of view or listening while you're listening, supposedly you're really rehearsing your answer. Like listening 
not to understand, but we have, we have automatic listening patterns that are often very different from listening to understand. And so this keeps you out of those automatic patterns. Okay, yeah, I'm just meeting here to write those down. So we have notes that I put it into your tips section. It's great mm -hmm. to harvest those. <clears throat> I'm quite excited about harvesting all these insights. <laughs> uh, so Ajati, did you have any tip that you'd like to add? Well, I think that any group that observes the facilitator giving empathy um, can gain a lot from that. So. I think being being really aware of any opportunity you have to demonstrate empathy is pretty powerful. You know, um, Christine, Susan was talking about, you know, what if somebody calls somebody a name or whatever, that's a great opportunity to stop and say, okay, sounds like, you know, and give them empathy. Hmm. I would uh, just add to that that within the process of reflecting, if someone says, oh, you're an idiot, uh, that, you know, I can just reflect back. So I'm hearing you say I'm an idiot. Is there more? And so in a sense, the process sort of holds that, but it's if the person gets triggered and then kind of wants, doesn't want to reflect that and lash back, you know, there's kind of uh, how to, kind of hold that, so, yeah. So, okay, then um, let's see, let me get us back to our slideshow. Oh, question. Oh, yeah. Don't we have sort of a ground rule that we don't call each other <clears throat> names, you know, in the circle? I mean, isn't there some kind of a mindset about that, that, that we're talking about our own selves? We're not no, in I, I've tried to in I'm, within. I'm curious, actually, because I'm. Yeah, still yeah, yeah. It, it it hasn't been. It's been like you know. There's a big thing within the political left and right that the the right is very you know upset about you know so-called political correctness. Like oh, you have to talk a certain way. So I've been just saying, say whatever you want. The person will reflect it, but you have to be willing to reflect what the other person says back to you. So if the person says, you know, you're an idiot, well, I'm hearing you say I'm an idiot. Well, I think you're a super idiot. <laughs> and then, you know, but then in, in a sense, it's just this, that everything, you can say anything and it's the empathic listening that sort of transforms it. So there's no sort of rules in a sense. It doesn't have to be I statements. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been sort of just uh, totally open. All right. But well, even though all those things can help mm -hmm. for, connection so that, that yeah so yeah I, I i i get that then i can live i can totally live with that i just thought maybe there was a ground rule no i've, I've been trying to leave the you know minimal rules so okay. you have freedom for speech but but there is the ground rule you have to be able to reflect back to the listener mm -hmm. the speakers yeah. uh, mm -hmm. satisfaction what they said that's like the core yeah. ground rule and and not put your own stuff in, so. All right, let me throw in one more. Okay, tip. great. This is probably not, <laughs> no, this probably is great. not that relevant for the average empathy circle, but maybe, you know, in advanced situations, um, one of the practices I teach is before we begin this discussion, because we know it's a controversy and we know we're on opposite sides, both people take a couple minutes to quietly reflect on what triggers that you know you already have could get pushed during this conversation. But that's usually with a, with a situation where the two protagonists have already been interacting and they've already been pushing each other's buttons like in prior meetings. It's that kind oh, of uh -huh. So you ask so them. them to reflect on it and say, just, okay, you know, and you say, okay, well, my my um, fear of not being heard button generally gets pushed mm -hmm. when I'm talking to mm -hmm. you. So I'm gonna watch for that button in myself, that type of thing. But mm -hmm. that, that's kind of advanced for a, a beginning situation, a circle like this. 
Yeah. So really, if I just reflect that back that uh, you ask people like, what is the hot, the button issue for people already in a relationship? What is your hot button things that have maybe happened in the past that might come up mm -hmm. and just to kind of be, think, think about those. Which sort of brings us into the next uh, step, which is to uh, do an empathic listening round. <laughs> so uh, to, to we're going to just discuss uh, using empathic listening, the empathy circle facilitator role. You know, any questions, challenging experiences, concerns, requests, you know, offers that you have. So we want to do a, a couple rounds of of uh, of uh, listening around that and we're back so <clears throat> if we just want to you know you were actually kind of jumping into that Susan I don't know if, if is there more that you have I could no I you know I could start this round okay if, if you want to start sure great if you want to start with this is one of the questions and concerns I have about the facilitator role okay if you want to okay, just so select someone somebody, um, Joe T will you be my listener Sure. Okay. This concern is about personal pronouns, he, she, it. Because nowadays the young younger people, I just have to say it that way, or the <laughs> or the people in cities or on the coasts or something, they're much more aware of fluidity of gender identity. And I fear that I'm not up to date on all of that. So you're observing the younger people in the different parts of the you know, country are highly uh, focused on accuracy when it comes to pronouns, he, she, it, and you're concerned that you're not keeping up to date um, so you can have a an easy, you know, and, and that may interfere with your ability to connect with these younger people is that a concern yes okay yes thank you i feel heard jyoti um and i was in a circle about a year ago with mostly grad students and that was actually the first time i became aware of how big a deal this is um and i've had numerous clients whose daughters are gender fluid and um you know who've educated me that way uh and what they did in the circle with the grad students was everybody had to go around the circle once before the beginning of the discussion and say what gender pronoun you feel comfortable using about yourself um, so your first introduction to this was uh, participation in a circle in grad school? Well, I was, they were grad students and okay. I was, you know, I was one of the more, you know, advanced, I was one of the older people at this conference. Okay, you're at a conference participating with some grad students in a circle and um, the opening exercise was to introduce yourself with the preferred pronoun that um, that you wanted to be addressed by so then this was your first introduction to to this whole dimension yes I probably should add just so I have a feeling in there that I um, I felt a little shy and awkward in that circle and and there was some discomfort and shyness in that circle for you Thank you. I feel <laughs> fully heard. So I'm um, left with, oh, like what are the practices? Is, that, is this going to be a relevant concern in every group I facilitate from now on? Empathy circles, my other circles. Is this something, how am I going to begin to integrate this new um, social awareness into my own vocabulary and um, and just plain educate myself better on this. So I'm um, I'm just kind of feeling 
uh, open, curious, and um, a little bit of anxiety about how and when I should be addressing this issue. So when you think about moving forward in uh, this incorporating the reality of this new paradigm in the culture, you feel a bit uh, stressed and curious about um, how to how to be more inclusive and and update yourself so that you're you can remain relevant. Um, I think I think I feel fully heard now. I li I liked how you said that. Yeah. Thank you, Jyoti. You're welcome. So I'm done with my turn. I think. So. It's your uh, turn, Jyoti. To select anyone. Pardon. You can select someone. We're just doing empathic listening. So just talk about anything I want to talk about. Uh, well, it was, is the uh, question we had there discuss the empathy circle facilitator role? Any questions, challenges, experiences, concerns, needs, you know, requests, etc. Well, um Let's see. Uh, I'll talk to Bill. Okay, listening. And um, when uh, Susan mentioned this pronoun issue, um, I was very refret. I was very excited because I have had the same experience. And it was a couple years ago. I was in a circle, and it, I was the by far the minority uh, age wise, and these people were in their early 20s 30s and i was i was just astounded i was so surprised about how adamant they were about these pronouns and um if i if i was putting myself out there i, I this would be a concern of mine also and i think that I would feel I probably prepare myself with like a couple sentences that would um, you know contain a request about um, offering uh, requesting kindness and patience with me as I um, make an effort to um, please people with their preference, you know, meeting their preferences. Um, so you appreciated what Susan said about the, uh, uh, you know, working with younger groups and their gender identification. And you had a similar experience a while ago where, you know, you were the minority age-wise. And so you think it's a very good tip that, you know, you start to kind of put out there, hey, you know, I may not, um, you know, have the nomenclature that you're used to and uh, be kind and then, you know, give them an entree to talk about uh, how they identify themselves. What's the last thing you said? Uh, give them an entree uh, in the conversation as to how they prefer to identify themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't thought I hadn't thought of that, uh, but mostly my 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 thought is about how do I protect myself against um, hate mm -hmm. uh, and retribution coming my direction because I did it wrong. Mm -hmm. So you you are concerned about hate and retribution because if you make a verbal mistake, and then and then basically people unload on you. Yeah. Yeah, and so I just uh, was just contemplating how how could I set set things up ahead of time to mitigate or minimize some of some of that uh, mm -hmm. expected uh, backlash uh, in um, 
disrespect coming coming to me because I did it, did it imperfectly. Right. So you just uh, you're you're very sensitive about uh, any cr criticism if you make a mistake or a misstep or you know a verbal misstep. Yeah, I'd like to somehow put out front, you know, my wish for. for my intentions to be um, held with held with care and respect, and um, that my imperfection is also um, honored. Okay, so you wanted to put you know uh, set yourself up not as a as an expert or a perfect uh, image of perfection, but as another human being. And that you would any you know missteps or perceived slights that people might have, that they would then um, take that into account, present themselves in a respectful and encouraging way. Yeah, yeah. I think that. Thank you. That's that's pretty good. Um, Sometimes I, I think that uh, it seems as though the, the sensitivity that some people have that doesn't, doesn't seem to, to matter a lot uh, in public, public circles. Um, so if you, can make, if you can make it matter yourself, um, I think that's maybe at least a step towards staying engaged in an environment that seems pretty, you know, to, to me often way, way over the top and overwhelming. Okay. So um, uh, you want to, uh, basically uh, what you don't want to see happen is people kind of lashing out and uh, labeling each other and then turning away. You want to stay engaged. And also you were remarking about the difference between sometimes uh, behavior in a private conversation or in a public conversation when people feel like they could grandstand or uh, make a public statement. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks. All right, I uh, guess I'll go to Edwin. Okay, listening. Um, well, I go back to my, um, talking about this, uh, gender identity. Uh, we dealt with this at school. Uh, we had, uh, transgender, gay, uh, questioning, both teachers too, um, teachers, uh, not transgender, but, uh, gay. Um, and so, a uh, culture of ex acceptance, um, was very important. Uh, we had the, you know, the bathroom thing with the, you know, anybody could go and things like that. And then, of course, not because of any particular sexual proclivity or anything like that, but then uh, as a safety, uh, we would always, staff would always go and outside the bathroom to make sure that nobody else went in or bothered anybody, whether they were using the transgender or the regular bathroom. So that, that was my life. Mm. Uh, Yes, and I, and I questioned it many times uh, as I was standing in the cold and the rain and looking at a wall and the earthworms would come up and then they would die, these little baby earthworms in a little U. And I always felt that they were laughing at me. They were saying, <laughs> I may be dead here, but you have to kind of look at me. So, <laughs> so I'll stop there for now. Okay, so you had to deal with the, this gender issue about LGBT, transgender, etc. at your school. So you were involved in that, and your school tried to be accommodating, it sounds like, and yes. to the point where also if someone went to the bathroom, someone would sort of, sort of just, I don't know, if it, they, they'd sort of watch that nobody went else went in or... Uh, right. Not and, because and of the kind of adding, You had to stand there, and right. then, you know the worms were kind of laughing at you. So. Well, sarcastic worms, not sarcastic. not nice worms. 
Um, <laughs> they had they had nasty, sarcastic worms. Dead there. worms too. I uh, yeah, like uh, <laughs> so I won't go into politics now. Uh, attacking dead things. Um, so um, and 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 it was very interesting to me because also. Uh, although I would be, and, and I rebel against this, I guess I'm now cisgender. And somebody added a pronoun when I wasn't looking. I didn't get the memo. Um, and so, um, but uh, I, I had uh, gay roommates for 10 years when, uh, you know, I was living with my first wife and stuff. And, um, <laughs> and one of the things that was very interesting is that there was, a, there was a kind of progression around this issue. And at a certain point, you know, my roommate, Alan, came and said, you know, you know, I don't identify myself by my sexual preference. And it was very important to me. Um, and, and, and so I really don't, you know, yes, people want to be respected for who they are, sorry. Um, but... Um, they want to be respected, but they want to see uh, be seen as a person. So um, I had another experience was an African American woman. We were doing, um, you know, kind of a sensitivity training, and she came to me. You know, thank you for you know not just you know going with stereotypes, but really listening to me and seeing me as a person um, beyond uh, my ethnicity or anything else like that. So I'll stop there. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing is that there's sort of these labels, but what people really want is to be seen for who they are. That's my experience, yes. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, and, and of course we had sensitivity, uh, you know, training as far as, for instance, uh, one of the things that we were taught about African Americans is that, you know, some white teachers, you know, would want, you know, kids to look at them when they're talking, but in the African American culture, you don't get that eye contact. And so um, people who were not, you know, trained or white teachers might see that as defiance when it really wasn't. And um, so, you know, I just figured that I just want to find out who you are and I'll listen to you as an individual. And that standard stood me in good stead. Even if I made a mistake, you know, my direction was clear and I'd say, Oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. You see it this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for you, the core thing is just to see people have an interest in them and try to see them for who they are. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of an approach that <clears throat> you've taken that's worked well for you. So, so I guess maybe in a sense to see their humanity and uh, not, you know, kind of, and uh, these other issues like how you look like the, pronouns and so forth is maybe, you know, if to have that core value for first yeah. and foremost is what's important. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Edwin. I feel heard. Oh, okay. Then, uh, thanks. Okay, I'll speak to Susan. Unmuted. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so that is interesting. I, I hadn't come across the uh, pronoun issue within an empathy circle yet but doesn't mean it won't happen um and i've heard it yeah become more and more in different contexts you know in the education field and so forth uh it become more of a issue okay ready for me to repeat yeah that? i just give a okay. pause there like, so uh, up to now, Edwin, you haven't had the experience where the gender identity pronouns became an issue in an empathy circle, but you're open to what's going to happen hereafter. Yeah, and I've understood that there's sort of a proliferation of these pronouns. Somewhere I heard there's 60 of them now. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of like people keep creating more categories. So it, it's been sort of a whole area that's more and more uh, confusing. Um, and I liked it in Indonesia. They have a word, it. You can use the word it. For, <laughs> so you just have one. for every, You can use that for everybody. And it's just one thing. It's an it. It. You know, so e too is the word. So I thought, yeah. 
So some way of just simplifying it. So uh, I, I kind of like that, uh, just to simplify it. So you, uh, you have read that there's up to 60 different possible pronouns that can be used now. Yeah. And uh, this seems a, a, a little overwhelming to you, I am assuming. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, you're thinking about how in Indonesia, uh, there's one pronoun that you could use that just basically means it. Yeah. Use it for anyone, and you yourself prefer that simpler way. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's sort of a, sometimes there's like a guilt tripping, like, oh, you're not using the right pronouns or something. And it's, a, there, you know, people waiting to kind of jump on you. I don't know if that's what Jody was referring to, but I've seen sort of that. Um, it's something like that. So I guess I, I have some concerns about that. Just would like something simple so it doesn't, have, it doesn't get so complicated. So you're, you're concerned about the um, possibility and even the, probably the fact that some people jump on each other in groups uh, if they say the wrong thing. And so you would prefer to avoid that. Um, that kind of attacking each other. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's a, it, but it is, uh, yeah, it is something that needs to be dealt with. So I'm glad you brought that up. So I'm trying to think back to the facilitation. So what other questions? Um, um, I think that was that the mindset is what really, you know, that the, uh, how do I get into a facilitator mindset? You know, sometimes I think like, you know, people are kind of born into sort of this training, you know, mindset and just love it. And then some people are into a facilitator mindset and it's sort of the power and control of it that they, it seems that they enjoy. And, you know, it's like trying to find what is my mindset that I feel Good in because I do have you know some anxiety around so that what my mindset is it it seems like yeah maybe a lot of work <laughs> I don't know <laughs> I so somehow I've gotten into this facilitation but I don't know that I'm I'm like a natural born facilitator and how do I get into a you know into a mindset that uh, is comfortable and grounded and so I'm really sitting with with that. Uh, question. So more foreground for you than the than the gender identity questions is this question of facilitator mindset and you're thinking maybe you're not so much a natural born facilitator mm -hmm. who just enjoys the process and you're also reflecting on all the different facilitator mindsets like power and control versus just being kind of like easy with the process. Yeah. And it sounds like you're wishing to be less anxious and worried about how you're doing in the whole thing. Yeah, for me, I've tried to be, you know, it's sort of spacious in it. Like I don't want to take a lot of control. I don't want to be the, the guru, the, you know, the one that really tightly holds everything. You know, it's like, let's have some kind of minimal structure and, let people sort of run within that structure and sort of be more self, uh, self uh, responsible. And so, uh, but then it does create some anxiety in me too, that, you know, it's, that there, there is, I know, like I said, again, my partner, Joan, she loves facilitation and it just radiates her excitement. It doesn't matter what she talks about. People just kind of get, oh, she's having so much fun. It's just fun to kind of absorb that energy. So and that's not my approach. I don't think I project that. So I'm really, yeah, really have curiosity, like or how can I work into a mindset where I feel there's growth, I'm enjoying it, you know, it's not just feels like work. It's, yeah, it, it's, I'm really sort of uh, trying to struggle with, with that underlying mindset. So basically your, your thought about yourself with the mindset is you'd like to be spacious 
and yet you um, wonder about how you can be more, be more, um, and just have more, just fun, and and be really engaged uh, in a way that that kind of meets more of your needs. Yeah, and uh -huh. you do sort of compare um, yourself to your partner Joan, who just seems to have a lot of fun with the process, and you're not there. You're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the last three piece is I'm looking for more calmness, more groundedness, calmness, and centeredness in, in the facilitation. So it's a little bit of a something that I've been looking at recently. So I'll just end with that. Yeah. So what you're, what you're looking for in your facilitation is more calmness, groundedness, centeredness, so that you can be more present and have mm -hmm. more fun. Yeah, I feel fully heard. Thank you. That was really helpful. Wow. And we can do another round since. So I'll 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 go some more. Um, ah, when I'm listening to people, uh, I guess particularly you, Edwin. But I'm, of course, let's see. I've got to have somebody to talk to here. Who's who am I gonna? Um, well, let's, I'll have Bill this time. We'll, okay, I'm listening. Bill, will you listen? Yes. Um, but I'm going to talk about Edwin for a minute here. When I, when I heard Edwin uh, say some of the things he was just saying about the experiences he's had with the gender pronouns, and maybe a little bit of what Joe T said about peop people mm -hmm. getting like um, angry or judgmental toward the, I'm making this up now, the old, the old person who's not with it, you know, or Edwin going, ah, kind of like the way I heard Edwin is, ah, I guess we got to deal with this. Mm -hmm. uh, the thought that came up in my mind is here's a very interesting polarization between the new wave, which is the need for change, and the old guard that says, what's the problem, folks? Why, why aren't the old pronouns good enough? Mm -hmm. So I'm getting excited with making that um, parallel here. Okay, so you wanted to, you were interested in uh, Edwin's take and you're kind of fascinated with Edwin's take around this whole issue and around the dichotomy between kind of the young uh, Turks versus the old guard, if we're going to use some cliches. Um, and, uh, but you're, you know, rather than feeling intimidated, you're feeling kind of challenged and stimulated and, uh, are thinking and seems to be th thinking creatively around the situation. I, okay. And, um, I really, I actually really want us as facilitators, I, I, I didn't even come in with this as a, a burning issue. I thought of it when I was trying to write down, I wrote down he, she in my introductory question, you know, and then mm. I thought, whoops, there's more than he, she now, you know, mm. and that was right as I was preparing to get on this call. Mm. And then it all of a sudden came full blown as a concern, like in, in me. And what I'm more concerned with now or interested in is the potential polarization between the old and the new. I do organizational consulting and, and you know, like with teachers. Mm -hmm. And there's the new teachers who want to try the new things and the old teachers, I mean, and it really does usually divide by age, the old teachers mm -hmm. who want to, um, you know, kind of stay the course. Mm -hmm. So you hadn't been thinking about this, and it's somewhat um, synchronistic that this came up because then it was uh, when you're writing your uh, introductory question, there was something to come, and you thought of he in terms of he and she, and you remembered that there are more than just he and she right now, um, gender identifications. And so you're thinking about, um, you know, uh, again, how that uh, then brings up a difference between the old guard or the younger people and the newer people, and you're relating it to your experience consulting with teachers, where the younger teachers were much more open to innovative techniques, and the older teachers uh, you were more to kind of stay the course. Yeah, so I'm looking at this as one of the old teachers right now, mm -hmm. who I'm uncomfortable and 
you know, I guess there's, in me, there's more of a fear of failure in there, like fear of doing it wrong, but it's some kind of resistance to change going on in me. And I'm thinking, well, isn't this what the Trump supporters in some ways have been experiencing? You know, like, why isn't oil good enough? You know, why isn't coal good enough? Uh, where are the jobs going? You know, why aren't pensions the way they used to be? Oh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So in your own uh, feeling that, uh, you know, feeling that things are changing very quickly and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, feeling a bit out of sorts, you also did an introspective uh, review and then also saw how, you know, your own personal responses might be seen by, as similar um, in kind to some of the Trump supporters as to, what, you know, how's my, you know, where do the jobs go? What, you know, how come this isn't the way it was when I was a kid? Yeah, and I think I want to re it we say again that maybe you missed was um, my fear of failure. And I'm imagining if I can tune into my own fear of failure around not being good at this, I can mm -hmm. get a little more empathy for the people who aren't, and of course I've already said I'm not good with technology, you know, mm -hmm. is some of the people who, um, you know, make America great again, who want to go kind of stay with, the way society was, even though um, you know the white the the white person is becoming a minority in this country and stuff like that. I mean, like change is happening, but mm -hmm. um, it's uncomfortable, and I'm and it triggers my fear of failure. Mm -hmm. So the so the what I missed was the was the uh, the how these change activated your fear of failure, which then engendered the introspection and the things like that and again you reiterated your uh you could see well this is another way to sort of empathize with the trump folks and how they might be feeling and even though you may not agree with the factual basis of what they're doing you certainly can uh maybe empathize of the feelings and that might be a way to bridge communication yes i i feel complete and i feel fully heard bill thank you okay sure thanks all right, uh, I'll speak to Jyoti. Hi. Hi. Um, so, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, I, I feel like uh, I have to protect my inner curmudgeon. Um, and, uh, you know, and I feel okay with that. Um, you know, uh, just because someone, you know, uh, has a new idea, you know, I, I'm big on means testing, you know, um, is it a better idea? Uh, things like that. I'm sort of agnostic about, um, like, uh, the gender identification. Um, and uh, so, um, what was it? It, it, it's, it, and it, there's a balance. Uh, I, I am uh, starting to present listening circles to special education students. And so uh, I was doing a lesson, and one of the things I was trying to talk about the benefit, these were middle school kids, and I talked about the benefit, you know, as far as, um, you know, when you start to date, if you're a good listener and how that's a real benefit to you. And then I said, you know, and I thought, and I came up with, you know, and you can then, it's better to attract uh, members of the opposite sex. And I stopped myself. I didn't put, no, if you're listening, Internet, all right, I stopped myself. And I said romantic partners. And that's fine. You know, that, that's a learning process that I feel really good about. Because I realized that, that beforehand when you said, um, you know, op members of the, op now, when I said it, I meant gay people and LGBT and everybody else. But that was sloppy. And, and I can certainly understand how people would feel outside, hey, you're not really talking to me. And, and I think that's, that's legitimate. Um, if I don't identify myself as cisgender, uh, as just a male or a, a regular guy, um, uh, I'm okay with that. You know, that, I don't expect to be you know, bullied by that. I'll stop there, I said a lot. So you started out by uh, 
standing up for your inner inner curmudgeon and yeah uh, <laughs> and uh is there something about neem testing i don't mm. re- well, well, yeah. what's that well i was referring to change and you know and and uh and then the people say oh change is good tell that to the people of the warsaw ghetto when they're being taken to auschwitz uh, no, the changes is good. There's, there, there are, you know, the things. Uh, if they were taken to the United States, it would be much different. Both are change. One is bad. One is good. So, uh, you're just addressing um, the assumption that we're all expected to embrace change, and pointing out that mm-hmm. not all change is good, and. Uh, and then you went on to talk about um, an observation you made of your your own uh, languaging around uh, your uh, quote kind of sales pitch for listening circles to mm-hmm. your needs uh, teens, and um, caught yourself uh, uh, using kind of out of dated out of date. Um, language around uh, mm-hmm. describing describing relationships and, and uh, I, I just sense that you um, were kind of uh, feeling good about having the awareness to update your language about how to address and um, Make make uh, what you had to offer more inviting to these people, to these kids. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I feel fully heard. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to talk about. Where's, um... You'd speak to me and say whatever, and I'll reflect. Um. And I'm hearing you don't know what to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't been involved in um, at a NVC or empathy circles or groups. I've, I've I've often thought that it would be kind of a fun project to see if I could get a group uh, at the library. There's a meeting room at our library. And I and I always um, I think that what I what I would like if I were to do something like that as a mentor, somebody to, you know, I don't know, um, kind of make an outline with me and go through like how to get people engaged, how to invite people. Um, I thought about just making it a book study group, like choosing nonviolent communication or something like that and just making it a group where we went through the chapters in the book so um yeah so you're sharing uh that uh you haven't done nvc or like empathy circles in in your area and you've been thinking about you know what would it be like to hold uh you know hold some kind of create some groups uh, that and it would be supportive if you had someone that you were working with to sort of help mentor you uh, in in the process to you know create the outlines and to do all the steps and um, yeah that's yeah I observed years ago the mentoring process that a friend some friends of mine were going through to become NBC trainers and it was a pretty pretty uh, rigorous and specific process they would you know outline have an outline for the program they're going to do and then they have a debrief and then um so that they could you know glean what they learned and it was an ongoing mentorship that they had which i thought was really nice um i mean i I could see how it was very helpful for a person just starting out. Mm-hmm. So you can really see how the NVC mentorship program was very supportive and you're, so you can appreciate that. And it sounds like you would like some sort of a program like that for yourself. 
yeah, if I get, yeah, that's probably what would um, give me the confidence to step out and make a start. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for you to step out, start doing some empathy circles and maybe doing like a book club or, you know, around a book that having a, a sort of a mentorship is support would kind of help you take step out to do that. It's, yeah, having some kind of, just a, some kind of structure to follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some structure, a support, uh, having a mentorship as well as a structure would be helpful. Yeah, I had a NBC practice group for a while and um, I just found that what seemed to be the why people didn't stay with it is people would be coming after work and there's a lot of traffic and um, just, you know, it just, it just fell apart. And um, so. So a block to taking apart that you saw was just, it's a lot of work. You have to drive through traffic. There's just a lot of, you know, work to get to the location and yeah, not only for me, but the participants. So the participants mm -hmm. would drop out just because, you know, they've been at work all day and then they had to drive someplace, you know, to show up in person. Now we have the computers and, you know, this is, eliminates that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so being able to do these Zoom calls eliminates all the driving and the transportation, so it makes it a bit easier. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, I can't remember. Did I go twice or, or did I think I didn't, didn't? We didn't. I didn't. So I go once more, I think. So speak to, unless somebody, I can't remember what mine is going. Okay. I'll speak to Susan then. I think, I think you started okay. the second round. Um, yeah. All those insights about how to, you know, get involved uh, is very important. And I think something like a book club is, I've done a book club before where, we, you read a chapter and then you get together and do an empathy circle, you know, use that as a process. I thought worked fairly well. Gives a structure, you know, you've you got something to talk about. And so that could definitely be, you know, a, a, an online, a, a productive, you know, structure for in getting people involved in, um, you know, a different topic besides just uh, politics or whatever. So, Ed, when you liked Jyoti's thought about the book club and you were thinking that a, a book club where you then read the book and do an empathy, empathy circle around topics in the book might be a, a good structure as well as uh, having more political or socially timely topics. Yeah, we had done one book, uh, the uh, Bill Miller's, but William Miller, who uh, his book, Listening Well. So it's a, it's a really, it's a, one of the best uh, sort of practical step-by-steps about deepening your empathic listening skills. Uh, so that could be a, yeah, I thought that that could be a good, something that we could reproduce that that would, could be useful. So you liked uh, this guy named Miller's book about um, listening well and you've used it mm -hmm. and thought that that's something that could be used as a, a a good book to start with yeah and you know yeah so those step by step making it easy making easy steps for people to get involved i think is important and to become a facilitator and that's kind of what i want to help design and so uh, all these insights are great to hear and the problems too. Now we got gender roles and all that too. And I and before I want to mention, I agree, Bill, that just change for change sake is not. I mean, there's a lot of negative change happening. So change for more empathic, you know, more empathic, culturally empathic direction, I think, is what's important because a lot of that change that I see happening just is not really moving towards more empathy, but towards more polarization. So um, that was, I would just add that too. 
so uh, there were really two different two different um, themes here that interested you in this in your last year that you brought out. One was you would like to see uh, our empathy circle trainings involve more of a step by step process about what's good listening and that and that sort of thing, partly uh, from Miller's book. Mm -hmm. And then you were also stimulated by Bill's notion that change for change sake is not necessarily positive. And um, so you just underscored your agreement with that. Yeah, this could lead to just more polarization. This is because the younger generation has a new idea. It's not necessarily moving towards more empathy. It can be leading to uh, more polarization and disconnection. So your idea is that... Um, some changes, and one example is things that the younger generation might have some ideas about. Some of these changes could just lead to more polarization in, in, instead of um, more mutual understanding. Or yeah. Of course, that's the high value that you have. Exactly, yeah. And what I want to stand for. So yeah, thank you for that, I, I feel heard. So okay, then we have about 25 minutes left. Um, Maybe just a quick, how are you feeling now? Uh, mirrored motion, just so we get a little bit of a physical motion. And I'm kind of wanting to get my body moving a little bit. You know, kind of the upper body's been a little crunching. So mm -hmm. if you want to mirror that, if you would. Oh, yeah, that feels good. I just love seeing you do that, Susan. <laughs> okay. My story is I'm getting good at this. <laughs> you are. Okay, do you want to go next, Susan? I'll you... go next, and uh, I'd like everyone to stand up with me. If it fits for you, that is. So um, I just feel like sort of slapping my thighs and going back and forth, you know. Really, really get to blood flowing again. Woo! Okay. Thanks for doing that with me. Yes, thanks. Uh, okay, Bill, you got one? Uh, I'm feeling uh, a little tired, so I'm just kind of... Hmm. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, I said, okay, so here I'll do it. So tired with a little bit of perk. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of perk. All right, that's it. <laughs> okay, Chanti? Um, Well, I've just been into this. So. Oh. <laughs> so I just went into another coughing fit, so... um. <clears throat> um, it just comes and goes, and oh, um, cough, cough, <coughs> cough, cough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, then uh, that was our mirrored uh, motion, and <clears throat> oh, the. Uh, I want to do this one. Uh, so this is uh, the completion of uh, one of, of this uh, module four, uh, module one, uh, session four. And I want to leave some time for next steps. So I just wanted to get a little bit of uh, feedback on how this was uh, for you and um, you know, the, the full uh, four sessions. Uh, I know one part was because of the scheduling, I couldn't do, do it all straight through, you know, just every week. So I know that was a real problem and try to not have that be a, that an issue next time around. Um, but, uh, and for me, it's been really helpful to kind of have a practice group to, you know, run this through and start sort of refining the, the process. So I'm very grateful for you know, everyone taking part to help refine it and, uh, for me too, I just love all these insights. Like, you know, I hear these specific insights, like, you know, hearing about the problems of starting a group and needing mentorship, you know, that that's really helpful to hear. You know, just everybody's uh, sort of insights. It, when, when I hear those insights, it kind of like a light bulb goes up and I feel like I'm sort of enriched 
like the facilitation and, and the process is really enriched. So I'm you know, very thankful for everyone for taking part. So I don't know if you want to go around, just kind of share your what you like and what you wish and you know, what if. Uh, well, I like, I'll say, okay. I like hearing that something I said was a contribution. Because <laughs> I, I don't feel very, uh, like I have much to offer. So it was good mm -hmm. to hear that something I said was helpful. Oh, great. Yeah, very helpful. Every every insight is, I find every sharing is, is helpful. So is there more like what you would wish for or like what if, sort of a what if? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bill or? Uh, okay. Is... Sure. Um... Well, I like the, um, you know, I, I like the simplicity and the layout of the course. Um, it's easily accessible. I feel that uh, through the four sessions, you really do get a chance to, you know, test your facilitation skills or, you know, listening skills. Um, I agree that, you know, it was difficult uh, when, you know, it's just on one person to be all that consistent. So hopefully as we grow, that we'll have more people filling in, we can be more consistent. Um, and the other thing is, is that uh, I feel really appreciative of everybody in this group, those who are even not here today, in the sense that I feel that I'm, you know, part of a strong community. Uh, people are going out there and they have skills and they're obtaining skills. And, um, and, and then I always like to feel that we're creating the empathic, empathic society that we wish right here, right now. So we're successful right now. That's it. Great, thanks. Well, I really like the training for a, a number of reasons. I like the whole structure of it. I thought that it, it gave me uh, a, a good, um, what I needed in order to be able to facilitate these things. I think if I had a handbook that said, okay, these are the steps in the, you know, in the first empathy circle or whatever, that I, I could, I think I'm ready to facilitate an empathy circle, even though I said I might have a little trouble with uh, the screenshot bit, uh, sharing, screen sharing thing, I mean. Um, oh, I'm willing to learn on the job. So I, I, I feel good about where I'm at now. I think I've become a better listener through the practice that I've had in this. And I wanna echo what Bill said, which is I like getting to know the people. <laughs> I enjoy just listening to everybody's realities. And um, so that's, that's the most fun for me was just that, that last piece. I do have a question. I noticed that when we were the, in the listener role today, and I actually think maybe a lot of the time, that we don't say, did I get it? Or did I hear you? or something like that. Are we, so it's really a question I need an answer to. Are we supposed to say at the end of our, you know, we have different chunks that before the speaker says, I feel fully heard. Are we supposed to say, did I get it? Uh, you don't have to, it's just you reflect back and then that it's up to the speaker really to say, yeah, I, that's not quite it. So it's up to the speaker. Okay. Sometimes I'll, I'll, you know, I'll say that I get it, but it's not really required. Good. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. you, you mean, you mean you'll say, did you get it? I, wait, I, I didn't understand that last sentence. Oh, it, you're saying for the listener to ask if they're getting what no, was said? No, no. Uh, yeah, the listener. Yes. Uh -huh. the listener to say, did I get it? Are you, is that what you just oh. said? You can, you can, you know, you can say it, but I just, it, it's not really needed. I get, no, I understand that part. There was just something you said that I, that I think I missed a word. So oh, I uh, forget that. I've, okay. I've already okay. um, filled in the blanks of my own question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah. No, I got that. You, you just said that um, it's really your own personal preference. Yeah. So it's really the speaker. Sure, you're pretty sure you got it. You don't have to yeah. ask that I get it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really up to the speaker. It's their job to say, that's it or not. You know, you're putting it out there. You're reflecting it. 
And sometimes I'll say, is there more? Just in case, if there's a speaker who is not very comfortable or, you know, who doesn't see that they seem to be a little awkward, I might ask, is there more? Just to encourage them or they're kind of struggling a little bit. And sometimes that, is there more, will stimulate them to share uh, some more. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, possibly another uh, part of the training module would be to specifically uh, encourage speakers to correct the listeners. Because mm -hmm. I find mm -hmm. that when they do that, I don't feel defensive. I feel that I go deeper and I, it's, a, it's, a little, it's more meaningful and, and it's sort of like testing my skills. So I kind of feel stretched out. And so for the rest of the people listening to it, you know, I like that. Yeah, I see this now that we've got a basic, you know, a module, right? We've got, you know, the, the, the work, the uh, empathy circle, the speaker, the listener, the facilitator. So we've got a basic cycle to go through. And all this that we've harvested from this can go into, you know, refining as well as creating uh, other modules. And yeah. I will, let me just share this for some next steps and get any feedback. Uh, about this. So what are possible next steps? I'm looking at designing additional modules for session one, which is uh, the coordinator role. So that's like the producer coordinator because that's actually a huge part. It's probably the biggest part, the most time consuming is all the organizations bring people in, uh, you know, especially if it's more of a contentious environment, you're reaching out to the left, reaching out to the right, uh, setting the, finding the location, uh, doing the uh, technical part of, uh, of you know, the, the screen sharing, the, uh, the, if, you know, dividing into groups, you know, doing the online stuff. So de kind of dealing with all the technical parts, kind of separating that out from the facilitator uh, role. So, you know, creating a topic on how to create a Facebook event, you know, how to, publicize it on Facebook, how to, you know, try to draw people in. And uh, I had mentioned in the circle beforehand that Marshall Rosenberg did mediations between African tribes. And he did two days of mediation against these tribes that had been at war. But it took almost a year to bring them together, you know, of somebody else coordinating that, of reaching out, talking to the different sides, scheduling the time, you know, building relationships to the point where you actually do the circle. And that's what I'm finding too in holding these circles. It's like the facilitation is like the, it's like one of the smallest pieces. This coordinator role is like huge. And then the other step is the reflective listener that there is sort of two parts to the listening. There's the, just the listening and, and all the dynamics that go into listening. And the second part is reflecting back. And it, almost that there's almost like two circles, you know, two, each of those can be a bit, you know, it's a pretty big topics themselves. So it may be creating a second uh, part, uh, two parts to the listener, the listener and doing the reflection. So, so I'm looking at maybe this additional. So, and then I want to create module two will be the empathy uh, cafe. Uh, so it's about how do you hold a cafe, which is, again, there's roles, there's, a, there's going to be a cafe facilitator, there's the group facilitators, there's the coordinators, and all those parts too. So it's a, it's a level up of complexity when you're dealing with groups, and especially doing them in person and online. So Lou, who lives in Petaluma, uh, Susan, you might be interested, he's holding these conversation cafes which are basically empathy cafes. Mm. And uh, he's kind of organizing facilitators and it's at a cafe in Petaluma. And, uh, you know, so it's an in-person group and they got to send out flyers. I think it's the second Tuesday of every month they're going to start doing it. And we might go up there too, Bill and I or Dave, or we talked about going up there too. So. So how can I get on that list? Of course, I teach on the second Tuesday of every month, but... Um, uh, six o'clock? Yeah, I teach at seven. Oh, okay. 
if so, I, <laughs> that's like forever. I've always been. I've always. Oh, been okay. On if, I, if he changes, I'll let you know about it. Yeah, it's earlier. If it's in the day, but yeah. Um, or but maybe he'll ship dates or something. Yeah, I'd like to get on his list. So cool. Yeah, so it's in your neighborhood, I think, right? Yeah. So, um, so how is there somewhere I can go to get on his list? Um, I'd have to email, send him your email, you his email. Yeah. I don't think he has an official list for that yet that I know of. Um, I'll, I'll send you, I'll connect you with with him he'd love to have I've facilitators seen him. Yeah, to help I've seen him on the you know in your past circle yeah so okay so that's the module and then i'm thinking maybe next week to create a facilitator support group like have a meeting and say well as if kind of open it up to the broader you know group maybe set something up regularly so these are sort of next possible steps you know you're welcome to take part and uh and then i also want to start another iteration of this training you know once i get this stuff all documented harvested you know we'll start another iteration of this training and you know keep building on it and then we're also looking at doing our own local east bay empathy cafes you know maybe through the churches and stuff so i wonder if you have any kind of thoughts or kind of feedback on else on that to me the biggest challenge is getting people in the room yeah mm -hmm. and you know you're calling that part of the producer role but i don't know i mean i imagine that if i'm if my my general bias is is if 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 i got good enough and was leading these circles regularly that I ought to also do the producer role. I, I just think it's, I don't know, it, uh, you know, this is just my own story. It's too much to ask somebody to just come and be my technical assistant. It's just, I, I don't, I don't have, um, I don't have a lot of chops with right. getting volunteers to put in that kind of effort you know, like for no pay and stuff. Right. Yeah. I'm used to paying people to do that kind of stuff. And I, in this case, would just, just as soon learn to do it myself. So. That's well, that's it. We're sort of dividing the roles, but you can be one person and just do everything. So yeah, I, I think I want to be able to do facilitation and uh -huh. producing at once. And then the whole getting people into the room thing. Well, that would be possible. I mean, at this point, it's the facilitators, producer's responsibility too, right? Yeah, so that could be like the whole topic yeah, of it. But I don't know about that's that's like huge. Yeah. Like the stuff you do, Edwin, you're the really the one who puts everything out on Facebook and gets visibility and mm -hmm. you know, you were inter in interviewed on new dimensions now and yeah. so it's gonna be more on the BBC more. we're in that's that. Great. Yeah. So you gotta write a book, Edwin. That's right. Yeah, so. That's what I, I've written three books and it almost killed me. So, oh. <laughs> but there are books on empathy. I, no. you know, on empathy. Well, hopefully, maybe out of mm -hmm. all this, something will emerge because mm -hmm. those are almost three bookshelves full of empathy books. Mm -hmm. And there's just one, uh, a simple that one book by Bill Miller, the kind of the how to. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of what I like is like how do you actually, you know do it so maybe yeah maybe write something or maybe somebody wants to co-author i don't know i'm kind of open for that i told you i'd help yeah it's easy are you a good writer but you gotta be no yeah, well i mean you'll find out <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll write an article let's write an article uh, yeah no yeah an article no uh -huh. all you, you the book's there you have all these interviews you just do one interview and you do your reflection on the interview and then uh, you do like sort of, okay, how does that fit into my, you know, the meta kind of travels with empathy. This is important. This is not important. So you really got the basic there. You just got to do a bridge. And I would, I would say, give yourself like six months to transcribe one interview and then do one reflection, you know, take the pressure off, see what you got. You can do that 
segmentedly. And then when you have the chance to go through all of the, you know, editing and the other things like that, you know, you've got your book written. So that's, yeah. that, that's my easy on ramp. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, keep that in mind. Uh, <laughs> as suggestions for the easy way of writing a book. <laughs> um, so any other thoughts about those next steps? Uh, how did they sound? Does that sound like a, like, hey, that sounds like a good idea, like, or, or other sort of topics. Like, I hear the topic of writing a book and also how to get people in the room is, right. the, you know. Yeah, the thing about getting the, I, I like the next steps, and the thing about getting the room, I think we're doing it, but I think what it is, it's a very long-term process. And it's through having these, you know, uh, you know, things online and the empathy cafes. And then at a certain point, you'll build enough critical, uh, you, know, uh, in, you know, people there so that you can then start to, it'll start to kind of feed in. I just think it's a long-term process. Yeah. I have an idea now. Um, okay. I know that word of mouth is what I depend on for m most of my customers. And um, I've told quite a number of people about the empathy circles mm -hmm. now. And uh, some of them have followed up and actually been on here. And is there a way, and this is kind of an idea in the form of a question, is there an idea, is there a way that, like at the close of every empathy circle, there could be like, okay, who do you know who might oh, uh -huh. enjoy participating in this, benefit from it, possibly um, also want to become trained because there's so many frustrated group facilitators and coaches, people who wish they had become a coach or a therapist earlier in their life. I mean, I have so many friends who like didn't do their education mm -hmm. early enough and didn't get on the road, but now they see me and other friends having so much fun in our professional life being coaches or counselors or, or group leaders and and there's this is something anybody can do who has uh, pretty good verbal skills and an open heart yeah so really at the end of the empathy circle you know who can you bring in so get a commitment so people kind of take on a commitment as well as for facilitating taking the training too to uh, I don't want to go. I, I resist the word get a commitment. It sounds okay. like the whole est enrollment process or something. Which okay. I, I was only on the receiving end of. But anyway, that's my own. Yeah. My own well, there bias. is, you know, with, that's with, a good idea, Edwin. I just yeah. have assistance. Okay. Well, we did, in mediation, there's a, you know, at the end of a conflict mediation, you say, you know, what would you like to offer and what would you like to request? Wow. You know, and you just put out a request and who, who would like to offer and then people sort of negotiate what kind of works for them. Yeah. And I just did that in the mediation with God and uh, Satan. I did a mediation with them and I ended up and they both agreed to uh, rewrite the story. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they negotiated that. So that was kind of interesting. Okay, so that was it. Uh, any final? So one more thing is, more? is where, could you put out a note of where, besides Lou's thing in Petaluma, which I can't go to, if there are other empathy cafes scheduled that I could just go as a participant and get a feel for that process? Uh, there's no others in person. You know, we might try to get some going here in the East Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's no other ones yeah. uh, of this type of, you know, Lou has been calling them uh, conversation cafes, talking about the community issues. So there's different issues in Petaluma. There's sort of, you know, racism, whatever, you know, specifics, community mm -hmm. issues that, they, that they're talking about. And I've been connecting with uh, some churches here. So looking at maybe holding some, cafes with with them so that's but first really trying to get this online okay. process all set up because it all kind of helps support that so okay that's good enough for now thanks okay so here we go this is our celebration I don't know if that's coming across so
congratulations, milestone. Mm -hmm. We've uh, done it for uh, sessions and um, kind of have a final, like a uh, hooray. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> milestone for <Yeah>. sessions. <laughs> you are now ready to go and <laughs> hold an empathy circle. So congratulations. So I'll send emails about so next uh, next steps. You know, maybe next week doing a you know a a, a facilitators cafe. I have to kind of uh, check how many people can take part in that just to kind of keep the ball rolling. So thanks for taking part. It's uh, this will be online, and the other ones have uh, six to seven hundred views on Facebook. So you know we're getting the word out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, feel better, Jokey. Uh, yeah. See you guys. Good luck with that bye -bye. old blue.